Nvidia is currently one of the most successful companies on the planet, and despite it holding up an uncomfortable amount of the US economy, they have a history of changing computer architectural definitions whenever it lets them either gain mindshare or your hard-earned American dollars. Let's dive into the one that bothers me the most as a computer engineering student, the CUDA core. The information age is one of the fastest evolving and coolest times to be alive. And with the recent explosion in artificial intelligence tools, Nada is at the forefront in the Japanese market for a new type of tool that allows users to improve their attention to detail by taking notes for them. If you want to increase your productivity, there are also native integrations available for the Google and Microsoft suites, Slack, and Zoom to directly share media and transcripts. Click the Nada link in the description and pinned comment, or scan the QR code on screen if you're interested in checking out a free tier account. You can run up to 180 minutes of transcription per month, allowing you to try the service and see if it's right for your workflow. Thank you to Nada for sponsoring this video. Now let's dive into the main video. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to leave a like and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I don't expect this video to pop off, but this has been on my mind for quite literally years thanks to various other technically minded creators in this space, both just making videos on similar topics or bringing up relevant information. With that out of the way, let's dig into what a CUDA core is and how what a core is in an NVIDIA GPU has changed over time. While I'm certainly not employed by NVIDIA, meaning I don't have direct access to design documents and goals, a lot of this information is shared willingly by NVIDIA from their marketing department. The term CUDA, standing for Compute Unified Device Architecture, actually originated with the API of the same name originally announced back in 2006, but initially released on the GeForce 8 series. At the time, programmers could code individual execution streams, or threads, that ran on streaming processors inside the GPU, which were literally just lanes in the SIMD warp found inside the larger macro structure, a streaming multiprocessor. Each streaming multiprocessor, or SM, has a differing warp count depending on the actual architecture in use on the specific card. However, each warp has consistently maintained the ability to process up to 32 integers or single floats at a time. In fact, the NVIDIA marketing machine literally says that a warp is a fundamental unit of execution inside the GPU, where groups of 32 threads execute the same instruction in parallel, aka a single instruction multiple data unit. Two years after the first announcement of the CUDA API, NVIDIA officially changed the name of each SIMD lane from a streaming processor to a CUDA core. This change from a fundamental syntactical level gives off, in my opinion, some misleading impressions of the capabilities of NVIDIA GPUs. When I, or even someone who's less familiar with computers and how they work, hear something being called a core, it's automatically assumed that each core has a the ability to execute independent instructions of one another and also some other hardware features. From the actual hardware inside these GPUs, how is it possible if each core is dependent upon 31 other cores in its warp? From a higher level, and this is also kind of relevant to AMD's FX series as well, when something is called a core, computer engineers assume that it has individual instruction decoders, individual ALUs or FPUs, its own memory access port to the memory controllers, a dedicated program counter and or stack pointer, along with a lot of others expecting more quality of life features, like the ability for software virtualization or local encryption on modern cores. CUDA cores are fundamentally not cores. They're lanes within a warp, which itself is a SIMD substructure inside the true core the streaming multiprocessor. In fact, a lot of the architectural syntax from the pre-CUDA era remains in NVIDIA white papers and advertising. The streaming multiprocessor and warps are the easiest examples. However, even when NVIDIA uses the term CUDA core, it can mean drastically different things depending on the specific graphics card and the architecture in use. First off, what a CUDA core actually is capable of, in terms of the data types it can process, has changed significantly over the past 17 years. Originally, a CUDA core could only execute arithmetic instructions on five different data types. 32-bit signed and unsigned integers, single precision floats, and signed and unsigned longs. Any other data type, specifically double precision floats, needed its own hardware execution block inside the SM. This also means which data types it can parallelize at an instruction level has also changed significantly over time. Leading up to Turing, each thread could only execute on one data type at a time, meaning that I could execute multiple floating point instructions in serial, 
followed by some integer instructions, with additional floating point executed after. Turing ended up changing this, so that each thread can execute on both an integer and floating point data path at the same time, increasing performance and also power draw since you're doubling the amount of active circuits on the chip. Ampere and onwards adjusted this, allowing for the same concurrent integer and floating point execution. But the warp could now activate a second set of floating point pipelines at the cost of the integer pipelines. This literally doubled floating point throughput per warp, and as such NVIDIA doubled the number of CUDA cores starting with Ampere. This optimization for graphics processing is incredible, because almost all your 3D math is done using 32-bit floats. However, it comes at the cost of additional data type throughput. This trade-off makes sense in a GPU, however it seems to come back to bite NVIDIA in the butt in some regards, because the new hot thing on AI models is low bit depth integer performance, which they sacrificed in favor of FP32. Additionally, you can still run the same algorithm using floats, however the smaller data types are being used to improve efficiency and reduce memory consumption. The way NVIDIA is working around this is by introducing other types of cores into their graphics cards, in this case the venerable tensor core. These blocks are designed to offload both sparse and dense matrix calculations, however sparse matrices or ones that are mostly zeros are by far the quickest for the core to actually compute. Actual data types available on these cores differ between different graphics architectures, but the most recent Blackwell chips are able to crunch double precision FP64, TensorFlow32, FP16, BFloat16, FP8, Intate, FP6 which is a weird one, and FP4 inside their tensor cores. Under the hood, all these cores are are specialized FMA units operating on 1024-bit registers. You know what this sounds awfully similar to? Intel's XMX cores. It's weird. It's literally almost like the same rough group of people designed all the tensor core implementations at Google, NVIDIA, and Intel. These actually function like cores in the sense that they have their own dedicated instruction decode block and memory I.O. ports. But these cores have also evolved in the breadth of instructions it supports. Turing and Volta started very restricted, only supporting FP16, Int8, and Int4. This was used in Turing primarily for ray tracing denoising, as the raw number of RT cores available on these cards was, and still remains even in modern architectures, too small to effectively compute the millions of rays you would need for a full ray traced pipeline. As a result, NVIDIA paired the RT cores with multiple tensor cores that could run a pixel lerping algorithm which in computer science is an abbreviation for linear interpolation, or edge detection algorithms like what's used in DLSS. However, with Ampere in 2020, NVIDIA introduced additional data types, specifically TensorFlow32. And since then, NVIDIA cards have become the default way to run TensorFlow or really any other secondary tensor math library on. NVIDIA even provides a relatively feature-rich but opaque library called Kublas, which is what TensorFlow and these other APIs use. Ada improved the raw number of tensor cores on chip, most likely due to the die shrink, and also introduced enormous private and public caches for the streaming multiprocessors. Blackwell is another step above that, and introduces some weird FP6 that I literally have never heard of before I wrote this video script. So whether or not it'll be adopted widely, who really knows, but the fact that it's there enables newer algorithmic precision targets within specific memory spaces, also makes me miss the full precision of FP32 and the space heater that my GPU could become before these efficient ASICs were introduced.